चैप्टर टू गांधी पार्ट वन पोट्री पिक्चर द अगलीस्ट स्लाइटेस्ट वीकेस्ट मैन इन एशिया विद फेस एंड फ्लैश ऑफ ब्रॉन्ज क्लोज क्रॉप्ड ग्रे हेड हाई चीक बोन्स काइंडली लिटल ब्राउन आईज अ लार्ज एंड ऑलमोस्ट टुथलेस माउथ लार्ज ईयर्स एंड इनॉर्मस नोज थिन आर्म्स एंड लेग्स clad in a loin cloth standing before an english judge in india on trial because he had preached liberty to his countrymen picture him again similarly dressed at the viceroy palace in delhi in conference on equal terms with the highest representative of england or picture him seated on a small carpet in a bare room at his satyagraha ashram or school of truth seekers at Ahmedabad his bony legs crossed under him in yogi fashion soles upward his hands busy at a spinning wheel his face lined with the sufferings of his people his mind active with ready answers to every questioner of freedom this naked weaver is both the spiritual and the political leader of 320 million hindus when he appears in public crowd gather around him to touch his clothing or to kiss his feet not since buddha has india so reverenced any man he is in all probability the most important and beyond all doubt the most interesting figure in the world today centuries hence he will be remembered when of his contemporaries hardly a name will survive he receives you without effusion or ceremony for you he provides a chair but he is content to squat on the floor he looks at you a moment smiles his acknowledgement of your interest in india and resumes his spinning wheel while he talks four hours a day he spins the coarse khadar his only possession in the world are three khadar cloths which serve him as a wardrobe once a rich lawyer he has given all his property to the poor and his wife after some womanly hesitation has followed his example he sleeps on a piece of khadar spread on the bare floor or the earth he lives on nuts plantains lemons oranges dates rice and goat's milk often for months together he takes nothing but milk and fruit he has tasted meat but once in his life usually he eats with the children whom he teaches they are his sole recreation and when his majesty's officers came to arrest him in 1922 they found him frolicking in the yard with these youngsters he not only prays rising at 4 a.m. for an hour of prayer and meditation but he fasts I can as well do without my eyes he says as without fasts what the eyes are for the outer world fasts are for the inner as the blood thins the mind clears irrelevancies fall away and fundamental things sometimes even the soul of the world come into vision like mountain tops through a cloud at the same time that he fast to see god he keeps one toe on the earth and advises his followers to take an anima daily when they fast lest they be poisoned with the acid products of the body's self consumption just as they are finding god when in 1924 the muslims and the hindus were engaged in killing one another theologically and paid no heed to his pleas for peace he went without food for 3 weeks to move them he has become so weak and frail through fast and privations that when he addresses audiences he must in most cases speak from a chair he carries his asceticism into the field of sex and like tolstoy he would limit all physical intercourse to deliberate reproduction in his youth he indulged the flesh too much and the news of his father's death surprised him in the arms of love he returned with passionate remorse to the hindu doctrine of brahmacharya which had been preached to him in his youth 
absolute abstention from all sensual desire. He persuaded his wife that they should live henceforth like brother and sister, avoiding all sexual behavior, and from that time, he tells us, all dissensions ceased. When later he realized that India's basic need was birth control, he adopted not the methods of the West, but the theories of Malthus and Tolstoy. Is it right for us who know the situation to bring forth children? We only multiply slaves and weaklings if we continue the process of procreation whilst we feel and remain helpless. Not till India has become a free nation. Have we the right to bring forth progeny? I have not a shadow of doubt that married people, if they wish well to the country and want to see India become a nation of strong and handsome, well-formed men and women, would practice perfect self-restraint and cease to procreate for the time being. With such a history behind him, he is naturally a rigorist in morals. He believes with Christ that he who looks upon a woman with desire in his heart has already committed adultery. He abominates prostitution and denounces the West for abusing a minority of the nobler sex in order to satisfy bachelors and adulterers. Prostitutes have become comforted by his message and have come great distances to lay their savings at his feet and pledged themselves to continence. He admits that India is oversexed and partly for that reason he would welcome the total prohibition of alcoholic beverages in his country. Even art seems to him a vain and frivolous thing when it is divorced from nature and morals. I love music and all the other arts, but I do not attach such value to them as is generally done. I cannot, for example, recognize the value of all these activities which require special technical knowledge for their understanding. When I gaze at the stars sown heaven and the infinite beauty it affords my eyes, that means more to me than all that human art can give me. That does not mean that I ignore the value of those works generally called artistic, but personally, in comparison with the infinite beauty of nature, I feel their unreality too intensely. Life is greater than all art. Added to these elements in his character, which must make him an unattractive figure to our Epicurean West, are qualities strangely like those that, we are told, distinguished Christ. He does not mouth the name of the founder of Christianity, but he acts as if the sermon on the mount were his perpetual guide. Not since St. Francis of Assisi has any life known to history been so marked by gentleness, disinterestedness, simplicity of soul, and forgiveness of enemies. It is to the credit of his opponents, but still more to his own, that his courtesy to them has been so consistent that it has won from them a fine courtesy in return. The government sends him to jail with the most profuse apologies. He has never shown rancor or resentment. Three times he has been attacked by mobs and been beaten almost to death. Not once has he retaliated and when a leading assailant was arrested, he refused to make any charge against him. Shortly after the worst of all riots between Muslims and Hindus, when the Mamdans of Malfa butchered hundreds of unarmed Hindus and offered their prepuces as a covenant to Allah, these same Mopalas were stricken with famine. Whereupon Gandhi collected funds for them from all India and, with no regard for the best presidents in matter of charity, forwarded every Anna without deduction for overhead to the starving enemy. Missionaries in India hail him as the greatest Christian of our time. Like Buddha and Miranda, he has suffered with those he has seen suffer. He has taken all the tribulation of his people upon himself, fighting for their freedom and fasting for their sins. 
And so a nation that would never have been thrilled by a purely secular call has put itself trustfully into his hands, has accepted his hard doctrine of peaceful resistance and has anointed him as its leader and prophet, its Mahatma, a great soul. We have the astonishing phenomenon of a revolution led by a saint. Part 2. Preparation He was born in 1869 at Porbandar in the province of Gujarat and was named Mohandas Karamchan Kanthi. His family belonged to the Vaishya caste or business class and to the Jain sect of religious devotees who practiced the principle of never injuring a living thing. His father was a capable administrator but an unorthodox financier. He lost place after place through honesty, gave nearly all his wealth to charity and left the rest to his family. Mohandas went to the village school and increased rapidly in wisdom and understanding. While still a boy, he became an atheist, being displeased with the gallantries of certain adulterous Hindu gods and to make clear his everlasting scorn for religion, he scandalized everyone by eating meat. The meat disagreed with him and he became religious again. At eight, he was engaged and at twelve, he was married to Kasturba who has been loyal to him through all his adventures, riches, poverty, imprisonment and brahmacharya. At 18, he passed examinations for the university and went to London to study law. His mother was loath to see him go and exacted from him a promise, sworn before a priest to abstain from wine, meat and sexual relations while away from India. In London, he did his best to become an English gentleman. He dressed with devotion and took lessons in elocution, dancing, violin and French. The schedule proved too much for him and in a lucid interval, he threw over the whole social curriculum and resolved to abandon forever the attempt to be an Englishman. When he returned to India, he was more Hindu than before. Those years in London taught him three subversive ideas, nationalism, democracy and Christianity. He observed the free life of the English and their control over their government and he conceived the idea that his own people would enjoy a like independence. He admired the English form of government and wished that British practice would conform with English theory. He marveled that a people so dedicated to liberty should be capable of enslaving a nation. The London Vegetarian Society won him to its creed and the English Theosophists persuaded him to study the most famous production of his country's literature, the Bhagavad Gita. He read Mazini and felt for India all that the passionate patriot had felt for Italy. He read Thoreau and learned from him the art of civil disobedience. He translated parts of Plato and Ruskin and he consumed page after page of Tolstoy. Here again was the doctrine of resistance without violence. Here too was the condemnation of all non-reproductive sexual relations. In his first year in England, he read 80 books on Christianity, but the only one of them that seemed to him to understand Christ was the New Testament. The Sermon on the Mount went straight to my heart on the first reading. He took the counsels to return good for evil and to avoid all violence even to enemies as the highest expression of all human idealism and he resolved rather to fail with these than to succeed without them. He had gone to England in 1888. In 1891, having been admitted to the bar, he returned to India. For a while, he practiced law in Bombay. He refused to prosecute for debt and always reserved the right to abandon a case which he had come to think unjust. In 1893, he received a call from South Africa to conduct some litigation for a Hindu firm doing business in Pretoria. 
when for this second time he left india he thought he would return to it presently and permanently he did not suspect that africa would hold him for 20 years within a short time after his arrival he had built up for himself a profitable practice in johannesburg with an income of over 20000 dollar a year he was for those days and at a remarkably early age a rich man he found his fellow hindus in south africa bitterly maltreated by prejudice and law they had come to natal originally as contract laborers gradually they had built up a thriving settlement whose growth gave the english and the boers an unpleasant topic to agree upon these practical people took various means of suggesting to the hindus and desirability of their returning to india at an early date they threw them out of trains and hotels insulted them kicked them downstairs and had them beaten up by those expert gangs which can be hired for these purposes in all civilized communities in 1906 the south african government passed an act requiring the hindus to report to the police for the taking of their thumbprints in 1912 the union court of south africa declared all marriages by hindu right to be null and void and the government of natal laid upon every hindu in the province a poll tax of 15 dollar a year gandhi was about to return to india when a committee of hindus asked his help against these disabilities they offered him large fees he agreed to remain and give himself to their cause he refused all pay abandoned the comfortable mode of life to which he had become accustomed and devoted all his time for the next 20 years to the cause of his countrymen in africa he organized and guided them taught them peaceful resistance and built for their refuge a rural retreat where any hindu might come and live if like gandhi he would take the vows of poverty and non-violence he presented the case of his people in london and secured large concessions he presented their case in india and roused the mother country to indignation when he returned to africa an enraged mob of white men attacked him at the pier and he was saved only because an english woman bravely interposed her own body between him and the blows it was a characteristic example of the english spirit of fair play in a surrounding of british stupidity the crowd had long before announced its intentions and an honorable government could easily have dispersed it gandhi himself was not over consistent in those days when england fought the boers he favored england organized a red cross unit of a thousand hindus and led them so intrepidly under fire that he was cited for bravery and awarded a medal of honor he had hoped that a grateful england would repay this loyalty to his race instead the concessions promised to him in london were ignored and when he protested he was sent to jail the authorities were soon compelled to release him for the hindus freed from his leadership and reverted to violence the government suggested to him that if he would obey the registration law it would remove many of the disabilities affecting the hindus he agreed but on the way to register he was set up by some mondans among his followers who inspired with the thought that he was betraying them beat him nearly to death he had himself carried to the place of registry registered and fell unconscious the british arrested the chief assailant but gandhi refused to make a complaint against him the man will yet be my friend he said his people now followed him in his compromise and the government rewarded him with a promise to repeal the poll tax when the promise was not kept gandhi led a vast procession of hindus in protest he was again arrested and was sentenced to 15 months imprisonment finally in 1913 the government yielded repealed the poll tax and restored the validity of hindu marriage a year later gandhi returned to india part 3 revolution by peace perhaps only now when he came back to his native country as a mature man seasoned with experience and tempered with suffering 
did he realize the extent of the destitution and slavery of his people he was horrified in his sharp social conscience by the skeletons whom he saw in the fields of india and the lowly outcasts in the towns it dawned upon him that the disabilities of his countrymen abroad were merely one consequence of their poverty and subjection at home he was moved as buddha had been by the sight of his fellows suffering i came reluctantly to the conclusion that the british connection had made india more helpless than she ever was before politically or economically the government established by law in british india is carried on for this exploitation of the masses no sophistry no jugglery in figures can explain away the evidence the skeletons in many villages present to the naked eye i have no doubt whatsoever that both england and the town dwellers of india will have to answer if there is a god above for this crime against humanity which is perhaps unequaled in history at the height of his first non cooperation movement he offered to the government to abandon his whole program of resistance to it and to cooperate with it loyally if it would undertake an energetic campaign against starvation in india the government did not see the necessity he had hardly established himself at home when the great war began that same preference for loyalty and cooperation which had marked him in africa drove him now to devote his energies and abilities as a leader to helping the cause of britain in every way but by violence his naive confidence in the innocence of the allies went so far that he advocated the enlistment of hindus who did not accept the principle of non-violence he did not at that time agree with those who called for the full independence of india he believed that british misgovernment in india was an exception and the british government in general was good that british government in india had just because it violated all the principles of british government at home that if the british people could only be made to understand the case of hindus it would soon accept them in full brotherhood into a commonwealth of free dominions he trusted that when the war was over and britain counted india's sacrifice for the empire in men and wealth it would not hesitate any longer to give her liberty in 1918 he wrote if i could make my countrymen retrace their steps i would make them withdraw all the congress resolutions and not whisper home rule or responsible government during the pendency of the war i would make india offer all her able bodied sons as a sacrifice to the empire at its critical moment and i know that india by this very act would become the most favorite partner and racial distinction would become a thing of the past at the close of the war the british met the movement for home rule by passing the rowlett acts which put an end to freedom of speech and press by announcing through lord burkenhead and lloyd george that england had no intention of releasing her hold on india by establishing the impotent legislature of the montego chelmsford reforms and finally by the massacre of amritsar gandhi was horrified on august 1st 1920 he wrote as follows to the viceroy it is not without a pang that i return the kesari hind gold medal granted to me by your predecessor for my humanitarian work in south africa the zulu war medal granted in south africa for my services as an officer in charge of the indian volunteer ambulance corps in 1906 and the boer war medal for my services as assistant superintendent of the indian volunteer stretcher bearer corps during the boer war i can retain neither respect nor affection for a government which has been moving from wrong to wrong in order to defend its immorality i have therefore ventured to suggest non cooperation which enables those who wish to dissociate themselves from the government and which is unattended by violence must compel the government to retrace its steps and undo its ways from his quiet ashram he sent forth throughout india a call for satyagraha truth seeking truth gripping 
no mere passive resistance but an active civil disobedience to an unjust government and a refusal to cooperate with it in any way. He had derived the idea from Thoreau, Tolstoy and Christ. He had been encouraged in it by his correspondence with Tolstoy and by the great Russian's address to a Hindu. He had practiced it successfully in Africa and in India. In 1918, he had found the peasants of Kaira in his own province of Gujarat suffering from oppressive taxation. He had advised them to refuse any taxes at all until the government should come to reason. They had taken his advice and borne patiently the punishments inflicted upon them, and they had won. As offered by him now, Satyagraha meant many things, the surrender of all titles and offices held by Hindus under the government, abstention from all governmental functions, administrative or social, the gradual withdrawal of Hindu children from government schools and the establishment of national schools and colleges to take their place, the withdrawal of Hindu funds from government bonds, the boycott of government courts and the establishment of private arbitration tribunals to settle disputes among Hindus, refusal to perform military service, the boycott of British goods and the propaganda of Swaraj, self-rule. Even the protection of the police and the state were to be scorned. The sooner we cease to rely on government protection against one another, the better it will be for us, and the quicker and more lasting will be the solution. More important than all these details to Gandhi was the method to be used, for without the method, the goal would be worthless. Greater than Satyagraha was Ahinsa, without injury. Unlike the revolutionists of the West, Gandhi considers no end worthwhile whose attainment requires violence. The greatest aim of all is to lift man out of the best. Violence is a reversion to the jungle. And the ability to oppose without hating or injuring is the test of the higher man. This gospel of a loving resistance pleased the Hindus because for 2,000 years and more, their religion had taught them gentleness and peace. Buddha had counseled them five centuries before Christ never to injure any living thing. Mahavira, earlier than Buddha, had instructed his Jain sect likewise. Brahmanism had taken over the doctrine and had made it almost universal in India. Gandhi's family had belonged to just the sect which had set more store on the practice of Ahinsa. Religion seemed to Gandhi more important than politics and humaneness more than independence. His fundamental conception of religion was reverence for all life. He added to the Hindu form of the principle Christ's doctrine of loving one's enemies. Time and again, he had pardoned his foes and in the breadth of his charity, he loves even Englishmen. He is not quite a doctrinaire. He recognizes exceptions. Quote, unquote. I believe that where there is only a choice between cowardice and violence, I would advise violence. If a man is peaceful out of the fear, Gandhi would rather have him to be violent. He says, with characteristic candor and bravery, risking his leadership with a word, the Hindu, as a rule, is a coward. Certain Hindus allowed robbers to loot their homes and insult their women. He asks, why did the owners of the houses looted die in the attempt to defend their possessions? My non-violence does not admit of running away from danger and leaving dear ones unprotected. For too many weaklings, he says, non-violence serves merely as a mask to cover this abject cowardice. Must they not develop the ability to defend themselves violently before they could be expected to appreciate non-violence? Nevertheless, there is in such cases something higher than violent resistance. It is when a man attacked resists, as well as he can without violence, and then overcome, refuses to surrender, but accepts the blows unanswered, and if necessary dies at his post. So it should be with India. I would risk violence a thousand times rather than emasculation of the race. I would rather have India resort to arms to defend her honor 
than that she should in a cowardly manner become or remain a helpless victim to her own dishonor. But I believe that non-violence is infinitely superior to violence. He distrusts violence because at the outset it empowers the unreasoning mob and in the end it exalts not just man but the most violent. He rejects Bolshevism, therefore as alien to the character and purpose of India. It may be that in other countries government may be overthrown by brute force but India will never gain its freedom by the naked fist. His newer aides, like the younger Nehru, are eager to arm the Hindus and follow Russia's example, but Gandhi warns them that a freedom based upon killing can never lead to anything more than a change of masters. I do not believe in short, violent cuts to success. Bolshevism is the necessary result of modern materialistic civilization. Its insensate worship of matter has given rise to a school which has been brought up to look upon materialistic advancement as the goal and which has lost all touch with the final things of life. It is our good fortune in America that Lenin and Gandhi do not agree that two great peoples, as if our own instructions are moving by diverse paths to kindred ends. Just as Russia and America are rival laboratories designed, so to speak, by the spirit of history to test the communistic versus the individualistic method of production, distribution and living, so Russia and India will be rival laboratories to test the violent versus the peaceful method of social revolution. Never has history made such crucial experiments on so vast a scale or offered any generation, not even Christ's, so significant a spectacle. For in India, Christ is again on trial and stands face to face once more with Rome. But is not non-violent resistance a vain idolist's dream? One hears an sardonic laughter of Lenin, and Gandhi asks in return what progress is made when one form of violence is replaced by another, or materialistic ambition is incorporated and nationalized at the point of a million bayonets. You of the West, he says, have been taught it is violent power which wins. The truth is that it is passive resistance which has always won. He cites the victory of the Christians over the Roman Empire as a classic example. And in our own day, he thinks, the League of Nations can reorder the world by practicing non-cooperation without violence. He regretted the decision of China to fight the West with the weapons of the West and predicted that the only result would be a patriotic substitution of homemade violence for foreign. In casting off Western tyranny, it is quite possible for such a nation to become enslaved to Western thought and methods. This second slavery is worse than the first. Always it is better to lose without violence than to win with it. In the one case, we sacrifice our personal will, which is a delusion. In the other, we sacrifice our distinctive humanity itself. The West will think Ahimsa a weakling's creed, a fig leaf of philosophy to hide an intellectual's cowardice. Therefore, Gandhi tells his people, India must be ready to suffer anything in its campaign for freedom, and yet never make violent retaliation. To blows and shots, to bombs and shells, there must be one reply, patient refusal to deal in any way with British merchants, British goods or the British government. Bravery on the battlefield is impossible for India, but bravery of the souls remain open to us. Non-cooperation means nothing less than training in self-sacrifice. It is as a brother said to Dhan Gopal Mukherjee, quote, unquote, until our blood is split in rivers, nothing can shake the foundation of British rule. We should make a holocaust of ourselves. Even if we are beaten, it will cleanse India of cowardice. When a Hindu talks like this, freedom is near. Part 4. Christ Meets John Bull We shall tell later the story of the revolt of 1921, how it made 
rapid progress in unifying India with a call to liberty, how it broke out into violence at Bombay and Chauri Chaura, and how Gandhi, in the face of bitter criticism from his followers, withdrew the whole movement on the ground that it was degenerating into mob rule. Seldom in history has a man shown more courage in acting on principle in contempt of passing expediency and popularity. The nation was astonished at his decision. It had supposed itself near to success and it did not agree with Gandhi that the method was as important as the end. The reputation of the Mahatma sank to the lowest ebb. It was just at this point, in March 1922, that the government which had feared to touch him before determined upon his arrest. Charging him with sedition, it sent soldiers to take him into custody. He made no attempt to elude or resist them. He asked his followers to make no protests or demonstrations, and he declined to engage a lawyer or offer a defense. His courtesy to all infected the court, and the judge treated him in the finest tradition of English chivalry. The prosecutor charged him with being responsible through his literary campaign for the violence that had marked the outbreak of 1921. Gandhi's reply disturbed every president. He said quietly, I wish to endorse all the blame that the learned Advocate General has thrown on my shoulder in connection with the incidents in Bombay, Madras and Chauri Chaura. Thinking over these deeply and sleeping over them night after night, it is impossible for me to dissociate myself from these diabolical crimes. The learned Advocate General is quite right when he says that as a man of responsibility, a man having received a fair share of education, having had a fair share of experience of this world, I should have known the consequences of every one of my acts. I knew that I was playing with fire. I ran the risk and if I was set free, I would still do the same. I felt this morning that I would have failed in my duty if I did not say what I say here just now. I wanted to avoid violence. I want to avoid violence. Known violence is the first article of my faith. It is also the last article of my creed. But I had to make my choice. I had either to submit to a system which I considered had done an irreparable harm to my country or incur the risk of the mad fury of my people bursting forth when they understood the truth from my lips. I know that my people have sometimes gone mad. I am deeply sorry for it, and I am therefore here to submit not to a light penalty, but to the highest penalty. I do not ask for mercy. I do not plead any exhausting act. I am here, therefore, to invite and cheerfully submit to the highest penalty that can be inflicted upon me for what in the law is a deliberate crime, and what appears to me to be the highest duty of a citizen. The only course open to you, judge, is either to resign your post or inflict on me the severest penalty. The judge expressed his profound regret that he had to send to jail one whom millions of his countrymen considered a great patriot and a great leader. He admitted that even those who differed from Gandhi looked upon him as a man of high ideals and of noble and even saintly life. Then, he sentenced him to six years in prison. Gandhi's son, Devan Das, followed him on trial, freely acknowledged his guilt of sedition and asked for the maximum penalty. Missionaries throughout India compared the proceedings to the trial of Jesus. Universally, men said that the old question, what the world would do to Jesus should he return to earth, had been clearly answered. It would put him into jail. The English Bishop of Madras spoke without fear and without equivocation. I frankly confess, although it deeply grieves me to say it, that I see in Mr. Gandhi the patient sufferer for the cause of righteousness and mercy, a truer representative of the crucified Saviour than the men who have thrown him into prison and yet call themselves by the name of Christ. Gandhi was put under solitary confinement, but he did not complain. 
I do not see any of the other prisoners, he wrote, though I really do not see how my society could do them any harm. But I feel happy. My nature likes loneliness. I love quietness. And now I have opportunity to engage in studies that I had to neglect in the outside world. He instructed himself sedulously in the writings of Bacon, Carlyle, Ruskin, Emerson, Thoreau, and Tolstoy, and so last long hours with Ben Jonson and Walter Scott. He read and reread the Bhagavad Gita. He studied Sanskrit, Tamil, and Urdu so that he might be able not only to write for scholars but to speak to the multitude. He drew up a detailed schedule of studies for the six years of his imprisonment and pursued it faithfully till accident intervened. I used to sit down to my books, he said later, with the delight of a young man to twenty-four and forgetting my four and fifty years and my poor health. Long before the expiration of his sentence, he was stricken with appendicitis. He had often denounced Western medicine as false and worthless, but when the British physician recommended an operation, Gandhi offered no resistance. It was rather the doctor who hesitated. If you die under my hands, he said, every Hindu will think I killed you. Gandhi signed a paper absolving him in advance, and the operation proceeded to a successful conclusion. When the patient was strong enough to leave the hospital, the government did not send him back to jail. It released him. February 24, 1924 A vast crowd of his countrymen gathered at the gates of the prison to welcome him, and many kissed his coarse garment as he passed. But he shunned politics and the public eye, pled his weakness and illness, retired to his school at Ahmedabad and lived there for many years in solitude with his students. Part 5 the religion of Gandhi. From that retreat, he sent forth weekly editorials to his principal mouthpiece, Young India. Never has incidental literature been so vital or so absorbing. From these pages, we come to know that the man across our barriers of traditions and space, and as we read, we perceive that he is not only a saint, but also a prophet and a philosopher. He is first of all a man of religion, that is, he believes it is better to be good than great and that right will conquer in the end. Most religious men I have met are politicians in disguise. I, however, who wear the guise of a politician, am at heart a religious man. He had to be a politician, even a statesman, could not have united India. India stands for religion and will follow only a saint. My patriotism is subservient to my religion, he says. India is great and holy, but greater and holier is truth. To this extent, the nationalism vibrating in Indian's revolution finds no encouragement in the Oriental resolve. Nevertheless, despite his piety, he loves at the little Mahatma, and rejects the idea that he is a saint. I have no special revelation of God's will. I have no desire to found a sect. He hoped that his arrest would rid India of the superstition about my possession of supernatural powers. Doubtless, other founders of religion protested in the same way, and Gandhi himself protests to no avail. Already, Peasant cottages show pictures representing him as a reincarnation of Sri Krishna. A few centuries, hence, he will be a god. He is too tolerant to be the conscious founder of a new religion. He is so inclined towards Christianity that his Hindu enemies call him a Christian in disguise. He is forever quoting phrases from the New Testament in one page. He cites two Christian hymns. He reminds his followers that not every man who says, I am a congressman, that is, a follower of the revolutionary Hindu National Congress, is such that only he who does the will of the Congress. The last words of his book on ethical religion are taken from Christ. He has scandalized Orthodox Hindus by requiring the reading of the New Testament in his school. 
He accepts Christianity as a moral doctrine and finds no fundamental anomaly in making it the policy of heathen India against Christian England. Why? he asks. Should you self-styled whites get it into your heads that Christianity is your special largesse to distribute or interpret? You have made a mess of it yourself. As a matter of fact, Christ was originally an Asiatic, as were all founders of religion, and I think we understand him better than you do. But just as a Hindu can be a Buddhist and a Brahminist, or a Buddhist and an atheist at the same time, and just as a Chinese can be at once a Confucian, a Taoist, and a Buddhist, so Gandhi thinks it nothing strange that he should be at once a Christian and a follower of the ancient Hindu faith. The world, and therefore we, can no more do without the teaching of Jesus than we can without that of Muhammad or the Upanishads. I hold all these to be complementary of one another, in no case exclusive. The spirit of the Sermon on the Mount competes almost in equal terms with the Bhagavad Gita for the domination of my heart. He quotes the Golden Rule and then compares it with the couplet from an old Hindu poem taught him in his childhood. If a man gives you a drink of water and you give him a drink in return, that is nothing. Real beauty consists in doing good against evil. And yet, with all his welcome to Christianity and his cooperation with Mohammedans, he remains a Hindu in faith as well as in nature and philosophy. I do not believe, he says bravely, in the exclusive divinity of the Vedas. I believe the Bible, the Quran, and Zendavesta to be as divinely inspired as the Vedas. But nothing elates me so as the music of the Gita or the Ramayana of Tulsidas. Christianity is, in general, as true as Hinduism. But Hinduism tells everyone to worship God according to his own faith or dharma, and so it lives in peace with all religions. For him, personally, the religion of his own people is best. My faith offers me all that is necessary for my inner development, for it teaches me to pray. But I also pray that everyone else may develop to the fullness of his being in his own religion, that the Christian may become a better Christian and the Momdans a better Momdans. I am convinced that God will one day ask us only what we are and what we do, not the name we give to our being and doing. He has unequivocally applied this principle of tolerance and action, for India, like America, has its religious divisions, its Catholic called Hindus and its Protestants called Momdans. Gandhi has collaborated with the Muslim leaders in their own program and in a combined program for Suraj. He has presided at Momdans Congresses as Momdans have presided at the All India National Congress. He has worked incessantly to reduce the conflicts between the two groups. He has even endangered his life by a 21-day fast to force Hindu and Muslim leaders to cooperation and peace. He has denounced Hindu hatred of Islam and Hindu music played in processions before Muslim mosques. He has condemned at great cost to his popularity the war of Hindu and Muslim periodicals in the Punjab as simply scurrilous and though he has expressed his suspicion that the government secretly encourages these divisions he challenges his own followers by telling them that only those can be set by the ears by a third party who are in the habit of quarrelling of themselves. He carries his confidence in the Muslims to the extent of suggesting that they, like the Christians in India and the Sikhs and the Parsis, he allow to write into the proposed constitution of an autonomous India their own reservations for the protection of their minorities. Until Muslims and Hindus can agree, he says all talk of self-rule is idle. He paraphrases the saying of an Englishman and writes, If we Indians could only spit in unison, we would form a puddle big enough to drown 300,000 Englishmen. Hindu-Muslim unity he preaches tirelessly means Swaraj. 
There are few things in recent Hindu history more remarkable than Gandhi's announcement of September 18, 1924, referring to Hindu-Muslim riots at Lucknow. The recent events have proved unbearable for me. My helplessness is still more unbearable. My religion teaches me that whenever there is distress which one cannot remove, one must fast and pray. I have done so in connection with my own dearest ones. Nothing, evidently, that I say or write can bring the two communities together. I am therefore imposing on myself a fast of 21 days commencing from today. Was it a mere piece of display? To a certain extent, display was necessary. The need of Hindu-Muslim unity had to be dramatized. An almost theatrical stimulus had to be given to the national consciousness. Therefore, Gandhi went for the period of his fast to the home of a Mamdan friend, Maulana Muhammad Ali. For three weeks, he lay quietly in bed, taking nothing but water. I am not aware, he wrote later, of having suffered any pangs of hunger during the whole of the fast. On the 26th day, leaders from both the hostile camps met at his bedside and issued the following statement. The leaders here present are profoundly moved. We empower the president of the conference personally to communicate to Mahatma Gandhi the solemn resolution of all those taking part to preserve peace and to announce to him our unanimous desire that he should break his fast immediately. He himself shall select the means to be used to check the spread of the existing evil as rapidly and effectively as possible. Just as Gandhi is not shocked by Western worship of the Virgin or the symbolism of the Lamb or the drama of the Mass, so we must not be shocked at his simple acceptance of certain elements in Hinduism which seem to us rank superstition. As John Haynes Holmes says, Hinduism belongs to Gandhi as the Judaism of the first century belonged to Jesus. Most disturbing of all these local vestiges is his acceptance of castes. The many minor or subordinate castes which have formed in India will, he believes, soon disappear, but the four fundamental castes will remain in their present or an equivalent form, because he thinks they are demanded by the natural variety and inheritance of ability and character. He does not approve of intermarriage among these groups. To an American who questioned caste, he said, Do you not believe in heredity? Do you not believe in eugenics? Do you not have classes in your country? And to the complaint that it seemed unjust to hold a capable man through life to a low caste into which he had been born, he replied that he believed in reincarnation and therefore relied upon successive avatars to redress the balance. A capable sudra, if he lived honorably, would be reborn into a higher caste, having offended the radicals and the westerners with the defense of a dying institution, he offends the conservative and the great majority of his countrymen by advocating the emancipation of women, the elimination of the disabilities affecting widows, the abolition of child marriage and above all the removal of untouchability. In the history of the world religions, there is perhaps nothing like our treatment of the suppressed classes. If the Indians have become the pariahs of the empire, it is retributive justice meted out to us by a just God. Should we Hindus not wash our blood-stained hands before we ask the English to wash theirs? Untouchability has disregarded us, made us pariahs in South Africa, East Africa, Canada. So long as Hindu willfully regard untouchability as part of their religion, so long is Suraj impossible of attainment. India is guilty. England has done nothing blacker. So he announces boldly that self-rule is out of the question and undeserved, while untouchability remains. 
there is nothing untouchable in humanity he has adopted an untouchable girl as his own a laughing little imp whose gay prattle now rules his home and to the untouchables he offers the encouragement of his uncompromising program you must have the right of worship in any temple you must have admission to schools along with the children of other castes without any distinction you must be eligible to the highest office in the land not excluding even that of the viceroy that is my definition of the removal of untouchability let us face to the full the unpleasant elements in gandhi's creed he condones idol worship as a forgivable aid to the imagination of a people to harassed with poverty to have time for education and he accepts cordially the hindu reverence for the cow the cow to me means the entire subhuman world man through the cow is enjoined to realize his identity with all that lives why the cow was selected for apotheosis is obvious to me the cow in india was the best companion she was the giver of plenty not only did she give milk but she also made agriculture possible this gentle animal is a poem of pity protection of the cow means the protection of the whole dumb creation of god cow protection is the gift of hinduism to the world and then with his characteristic courage he turns once more upon his own people mercilessly cow protection should commence with ourselves in no part of the world are cattle worse treated than in india i have wept to see hindu drivers goading their oxen with the iron points of their cruel sticks the half starved condition of the majority of our cattle is a disgrace to us obviously he accepts cow protection or the refusal to kill cattle as bound up with ahimsa non injury to any sentient thing this is to gandhi the basic idea of hinduism and of all religions without it religion is merely a holy war the die is cast for me the hindu must cultivate either of the two faith in god or faith in one's physical might ahimsa requires belief in god for only if the universe is governed by right even though a right which we in our caves cannot understand can we believe in the face of violence on the throne that justice will win at last in the end we are all actors in the drama which god has composed we are to god what the characters in shakespeare's play were to the mind that created them i believe in the absolute oneness of the god and therefore also of humanity what though we have many bodies we have but one soul part 6 gandhi social philosophy it is evident that the profane secularization which industry has brought to the west has not yet affected india the typical hindu still thinks in terms of god while the typical white man thinks in terms of earthly profit and loss gandhi would not subscribe to the contention of the chinese philosopher hu shi that it is the west which is idealistic and the east which is materialistic that saving people from poverty is as spiritual a business as the intellectual love of god this phrase of spinoza's is almost a summary of hindu philosophy gandhi is not prepared like who she to welcome industrialization factories railroads armies as a necessary price for oriental liberation from the west on the contrary he abhors western civilization he wishes to be free not only from england but from the whole life of feverish industry in office and factory which england was the first to invent he looks at the slums and militarism of japan and turns aside india must not go that way he wonders what is the purpose and fruit of this western bustle and overproduction this strange mechanism for concentrating wealth in which the rapid production of goods leads to universal depression and poverty this marvelous system whereby the progress of invention results in great fortunes among a few and increasing unemployment among the rest he believes 
that under this mode of life leisure is destroyed rivalry takes merely material forms of the possession expenditure and display and happiness is in the end no greater than before all the invention and all the wealth he writes the people of europe today live in better built houses than they did a hundred years ago formerly they wore skins and used as their weapons spears now they wear long trousers and instead of spears they carry with them revolvers containing five or six more chambers formerly when people wanted to fight with one another they measured between them their bodily strength now it is possible to take away thousands of lives by one man working behind a gun from a hill this is in our day an old point but to gandhi it is a living horror he has seen the worst forms of imperialistic exploitation in south africa and india and he has known at first hand the filth and terror of war for the pursuit of material goods for their own sake inevitably ends in war our neighbor has something which would suit us well diamond mines in africa coal and iron mines in europe oil wells in mesopotamia markets and soil in asia and south america for our surplus of goods and men sooner or later we take what we can and hold what we take presently it is ours by sacred tradition and any attempt to put an end to the theft is a violation of the peace of the world what nobility can there be in a civilization that moves so naturally to murder and suicide to diplomatic lies and invented atrocities to universal conscription and prostituted press to gigantic national debts and another war as soon as a new generation of simpletons grows up to believe new lies not remembering the old such a civilization cannot survive it will die in the next war which will be between europe and america the time will come when the west will ask itself amid the ruins what have we done in these errors of life perspective the fundamental which vitiates western thought throughout is to gandhi a false conception of education every year the west flings upon life a million or more graduates trained in cultural studies or business methods but utterly untrained in morality and honor even if they are taught the ten commandments in school they see with their eyes out of school how well one may get along materially without these verbotens soon they are added to the welter of unscrupulous individuals seeking wealth and when they take public office they make official life a running sore of negligence and corruption gandhi's own school the satyagraha ashram aims on the contrary at character first and intellect afterwards ashram is a place of discipline satyagraha is the grasping of truth the teachers vow themselves to absolute veracity to hurt no living thing to refrain from sensual desire to live frugally to use no manufactured goods from abroad to take for themselves nothing which they might do without and the pupils are expected to learn from their example the course for all includes manual training spinning agriculture and the sharing of every menial task for 10 years the students are taught and fed without charge then they take the vows of the teacher or go free into life as the seed carriers of a higher civilization pledged only to ahimsa non-violence to life gandhi trusts that such ashram will arise everywhere in india rescuing hindu youth from the de-hinduizing processes of the government schools and creating a people with those qualities of character out of which all good things must come and without which india may be clever and enlightened but never again great hardest of all to understand is gandhi's rejection of western medical science at first he tells us he honored the physician who held himself always ready to alleviate pain but then he decided that medicine was the art of helping one organ at the expense of another that it removed effects instead of causes and that it generated new ills for every one it healed 
Like Plato, he would have the sufferer bear his pain, keep the doctor away and help nature to undertake the cure. It was vivisection that repelled him. He brands it as man's blackest crime and says, I detest the unpardonable slaughter of innocent life in the name of science and humanity so-called. And all the scientific discoveries stained with innocent blood I count as of no consequence. All this vast pharmacopoe is unnecessary. Let men have fresh air, good water and exercise and eat only what grows out of the earth and the doctors will starve. In Utopia, there will be no doctors, just as there will be no railways, no factories and no slums. This hostility to everything Western culminates in the rejection of modern industry. The old domestic industry where peasant men and women plied the spinning wheel and the loom and kept themselves productively busy in the winter months was good. But the confinement of men and women in factories making with machines owned by other fractions of articles whose finished form they will never see appears to Gandhi a roundabout way of burying humanity in a pyramid of shoddy goods. Most machine products, he believes, are unnecessary. The labor saved in using them is consumed in making and repairing them. If labor is really saved, it is of no benefit to labor, but only to capital. Labor is thrown into a panic eloquently named technological unemployment. Machinery is like a snake hole, which may contain from one to one hundred snakes. Where there is machinery, there are large cities. And where there are large cities, there are tram cars. As long as we cannot make pins without machinery, so long we will do without them. The tinsel splendor of glassware we will have nothing to do with, and we will make wigs as of old with homegrown cotton and use handmade earthen saucers for lamps. And then, the most romantic passage of all. Man is so made by nature as to require him to restrict his movements as far as his hands and feet will take him. Railways are a most dangerous institution. Man, by their means, is getting farther and farther away from his maker. What is the good of covering great stretches of ground at high speed? Or, as an anonymous Hindu expresses it to an Englishman. You have taught us to fly in the air like birds and to swim in the sea like fishes, but how to live on earth you do not yet know. What entrepreneur will solve that little problem for us? Gandhi offers a solution. What may be hoped for is that Europe, on account of her fine and scientific intellect, will realize the obvious and retrace her steps. And from this demoralizing industrialism, she will find a way out. It will not necessarily be a return to the old absolute simplicity, but it will have to be a reorganization in which village life will predominate and in which brute and material force will be subordinated to a spiritual force. The first move towards this end, he thinks, is the restoration of the spinning wheel. We must gradually return to the old simplicity. What joy there is in working with our hands! What music in the song of the wheel! How many composers have heard in its humming revolutions the spirit of the earth! The four hours I devote to this work are more important to me than all the others. The fruits of my labor lie before my eyes. But more than that, for a hundred years now, since English manufacturers destroyed the domestic industries of India, the peasant's cottage has been idle in the winter days. For half the year, 80% of the Hindus are unemployed through no fault of their own. How well it would be for happiness and a modest prosperity if the charkha could be restored to these homes, filling them with byness and adding to the pitiful small income of the rural family. But this revival requires a protective tariff. The spinning wheel cannot compete with the British machine loom. British cloth must be kept out that Hindu khadar may find a sale. Since this is impossible because of British control of Hindu tariffs and ports, the only 
recourse left to India is a voluntary boycott of all foreign cloth. In this way, $200 million would be saved to India every year. So Gandhi renewed the Swadeshi movement of the old reformer, Tilak. Cell production was to be added to Swaraj self-rule. He made the spinning of the charka a test of membership in the National Congress. He asked that every Hindu, even the richest, should wear khadda. If they would do that, it would give them unity and prove them ready to stand together against foreign domination. The response was not universal. How could it be? The great mass of the Hindu people cannot read. It is hard to reach them. But by 1928, great progress had been made. The Spinners Association founded by Gandhi had 166 production depots and 245 sales depots, taking in $1,250,000 a year. Hindu students everywhere dressed in Khadar. Distinguished ladies abandoned their Japanese silk saris for coarse cloths woven by themselves. Prostitutes in brothels and convicts in prison began to spin and in many cities, great feasts of the vanities were arranged. As in Savanarullah's day, at which wealthy Hindus and great merchants brought from their homes and warehouses all their imported cloth and flung them into the fire. If one day at Bombay alone, 150,000 pieces were consumed by the flames. Skeptics complained, but the imagination of India had been aroused. The needed symbol had come. Part 7. Criticism The outstanding feature of this social philosophy to a Western mind is its typical resemblance to the romanticism of Rousseau and young Germany of Schlegel's days. There is the same resentment against civilization, cities and industries, the same longings for old idealized medieval ways, the same preferences for the East as against the West, like the slavophilism of Dostoevsky, the same zealous nationalism and horror of foreign things, the same enthusiasm for vernacular languages, the same revival of early literature, the same call for freedom based upon the same belief in the natural goodness of men. I believe in human nature, says Gandhi, and like every romantic rebel, he enlarges his own cause to make it the cause of humanity. Through India, he will liberate the world. Swaraj, home rule, is not really our goal. Our battle is really a spiritual battle. We, the miserable outcasts of the Orient, we must conquer freedom for all humanity. When the West is sick to the heart of its progress and its prosperity, its machines and its speed, it will turn to India to be saved. We must not suppose, however, that all the leaders of Hindu thought accept Gandhi's creed. The most interesting pages of his weekly Young India are those in which Hindus of every rank from Tagore to untouchables write to him questions his views, and force him often to a precarious defence. When these critics are finished, hardly anything remains for a Westerner to add. They attack his religion. They consider him not a Hindu but a Christian. They quote his favourite book, the Bhagavad Gita, to show him that Hinduism counsels not non-violence but active, striking, natural killing for a good cause. At the Delhi conference, a Hindu rose and said, I oppose this non-violence, this non-cooperation. I ask you, is it Hindu teaching? It is not. Is it Mohammedan's teaching? It is not. I will tell you what it is. It is Christian. They attack his pacifism. Lusty young revolutionists call him a coward. Politicians call him a missionary. A thousand letters denounce his non-violence as playing into the hands of an England that respects, as the Irish Revolution shows, only bombs and guns. Politics, one writer tells him, is no field for saints. It is the everlasting struggle of group with group, which is the human correlate of the biological struggle of species with species. And like that, it is part of the inescapable sense of life. 
Gandhi has remembered Christianity and forgotten Darwin, but life is Darwinian, not Christian. Individuals must compete, groups must compete, nations, alliances must compete. To reduce competition in one of these is to increase it in the others. Conflict is the father of all things. To this traditional pacifism, the turning away from the competitive nature of existence, one critic traces the long subjection and abasement of India. If we look back, he says, We discover that foreign dominion over India is a terrible revenge on the country, a revenge which life has taken on a nation which tried to deny life. Meanwhile, the younger Nehru pours into the blood of India the iron of his uncompromising creed. Revolution without violence is possible, with violence if necessary. If the present pacific movement fails, without doubt violence will come. Another twits Gandhi with dietic inconsistencies. If ahimsa means non-violence to any living thing, is it not sinned against in the plucking of any plant, in the eating of any vegetable food? The discovery by the Hindu physicist Sir Jagadish Chandra Bose that plants have a sensory system leaves the religious Hindu in a precarious dietetic condition. How can he live without taking life? Although thousands of Hindus are killed in every year by snake bites, Gandhi prohibits the killing of serpents. Let us never forget, he says, that the serpents have been created by the same God who created us and all other creatures. Thousands of yogis and fakirs live in the forest of Hindustan amidst lions, tigers and serpents, but we never hear of their meeting death at the hands of these animals. I have implicit faith in the doctrine that so long as man is not inimical to the other creatures, they will not be inimical to him. Merciless, his correspondents inform him that Ahimsa is specially unsuited in India because the Hindus, as he admits, are cowards and will use the doctrine as a cover while the Mondans among the population are natural fighters whose religion sanctifies killing for a holy cause and finds many causes holy. The Ahimsa doctrine, says one, has made us sneaking, sniveling cowards, don't you think? asks another. That armed and conspired resistance against something satanic and ignoble is infinitely more befitting for any nation. Then the prevalence of effortlessness and philosophical cowardice I mean the cowardice which is pervading the length and breadth of India's owing to the preaching of your theory of non-violence. Two years ago, Gandhi writes, A Muslim friend said to me in all sincerity, I do not believe your non-violence. Violence is the law of life. I would not have Suraj by non-violence. I must hate my enemy. This friend, adds Gandhi, is an honest man. I entertain great regard for him. The critics proceed to point out the difficulties of satyagraha, non-cooperation. First, as regards the masses, they cannot be kept non-violent, aroused as they must be to achieve anything. They will soon smash and kill. Second, as regards Hindu holders of office under the British Raj, non-cooperation by demanding that they resign puts too heavy a strain on human nature. Many who did resign in the first flush of enthusiasm or display have crept back to their sinecures. And hundreds of leading Hindus who might have supported the demand for home rule are alienated by the call for their resignations, that is, for what they consider the starvation of their families. So with the boycott of government schools, teachers who left them are now destitute and wish they could return. Pupils who left them are flocking back. The national schools organized to teach non-cooperating students had no funds and could purchase only the most primitive equipment and the most depressing quarters. In one town with two government high schools, each having 500 pupils, the one national high school has 50. The national schools that sprang up in 1921 have, with few exceptions, died. The boycott of the courts had proved impracticable. For example, what could be done when officials of the National Congress absconded with Congress funds?
to which gandhi gives reply at the risk of being considered inconsistent i have no hesitation whatsoever in advising the congress officials in orissa to take legal proceedings against the culprits for the recovery of trust funds the congress has a perfect right to break its own law in its own favor in a well ordered state the maxim the king can do no wrong has a legitimate purpose and place it is the strangest passage in young india above all the critics ridicule his hostility to machinery the whole world says one is advancing in material civilization without which we shall certainly be handicapped it is now a settled fact that india fell a prey to western nations because she was wanting in scientific and material progress history has taught this lesson and it cannot be overlooked shankar nayar gandhi's bitterest hindu opponent reminds him again and again that partial industrialization is indispensable to the freedom of india because freedom requires the capacity for self defense and self defense requires wealth Gandhi answers that he is not against machinery as such that the spinning wheel is itself a machine but he is a determined foe of all machinery that is designed for the exploitation of people meanwhile fact moves on with no regard for argument new factories spring up every week in bombay calcutta ahmedabad and madras the tata brothers hindus organize one of the greatest iron companies in the world electric lights trolley cars railways motor cars hotels warehouses daily transform the scene and the traveler observes that the hindus just emerging though they are from the middle ages drive automobiles as competently as though they had been raised in detroit therefore gandhi's critics laugh at the spinning wheel as a vain attempt to turn time back in its flight it will revolve for a while by the power of enthusiasm poetry and imagination but never can the charkha compete with the machine sooner or later even pious hindus will buy cloth where it is cheapest and best the younger reformers think no longer of the charkhas but of a protective tariff that will promote the development of factory industry in india life inevitably moves out of the village into the city the first flush of native wealth will put an end to the mysticism of khadar khadar is dearer than mill cloth writes one correspondent to kandi and our means are poor the mill owners another informs him do not hesitate to palm off fraudulent imitations of khadar on the gullible public to which kandi answers i would ask skeptics to go to the many poor homes where the spinning wheel is again supplementing their slender resources and ask the inmates whether the spinning wheel has not brought joy to their homes finally the poet sage of india rabindranath tagore expresses in his gentle way certain difficulties which he finds in the program of his friend a courteous rivalry has arisen between the satyagraha ashram at ahmedabad and tagore's school shantiniketan at calcutta the poet speaks always with the greatest respect of the saint but always with careful reservations he finds a note of narrow nationalism in gandhi and worse an unmistakable quality of medieval reaction spin and weave is this the gospel of new creative age to hug the charkha to oneself and try to step out of the universal industrializing current of the world to think that a people can become great by going backward to primitive conditions irrelevant to modern life this again is a narrow vision india must move with the age she must think not in the terms of her own oppressed people but in terms of the oppressed of every nation to attempt to divide india from the west is a spiritual suicide to which gandhi replies when all about me are dying for want of food the only occupation permissible for me is to feed the hungry to a people famishing and idle the only acceptable form in which god can dare appear is work and promise of food as wages every one must spin let the god spin like the others let him burn his foreign clocks 
that is the duty today god will take care of the tomorrow nothing is more admirable in gandhi than his conscientious printing of these criticisms in his own press and his patient and courteous reply to all of them except tagore's he knows that he is but human there is no nonsense of inspiration about him he says disarmingly even if my belief is a fond delusion it will be admitted that it is a fascinating delusion and yet he hopes it is not a delusion it is not a nationalist dream it abhors war and aggrandizement and trusts to establish a mode of life in which the west weary of haste may find something worthy of imitation it envisages not india only as unhappy and oppressed but all mankind he knows that non cooperation is an imperfect thing that the ideal would be to cooperate with all but today it is a necessary discipline forging into unity the scattered races and villages of india already it has awakened india from torpor and given it new strength he knows how frail a weapon of the spirit non violence is in a world bristling with guns but what other course is open to a country absolutely weaponless you know that we are powerless he writes in an open letter to all englishmen in india for you have ensured our incapacity to fight in open and honorable battle that is a strange phrase for gandhi the british he writes want us to put the struggle on the plane of machine guns they have these weapons and we have not our only assurance of beating them is to keep it on the plane where we have the weapons and they have not the way of the sword is not open to india yes violence is the law of the animal world but it is not the law of the human world more and more the strength of the spirit outweighs the power of fists and guns ahimsa may make cowards or offer them a philosophy of escape but also it makes saints of limitless bravery who stands up to the pikes and pistols of the oppressors without fear and without retreat let the history of the revolution prove it and if india cannot attain freedom without violence she will not in the judgment of gandhi attain it with violence history teaches one that those who have no doubt with honest motives ousted the greedy by using brute force against them have in their turn become a prey to the disease of the conquered my interest in india's freedom will cease if she adopts violent means for their fruit will be not freedom but slavery part 8 an estimate how does the man appear now in the perspective of these examples of his thought of course he is above all an idealist not a realist he makes very little application of history to the understanding of the present he is unaware of the careless regularity with which fate has trampled right under might and beauty under power his citation of the christian conquest of rome as an instance of successful non-violent non-cooperation ignores the political and economic factors in that conversion of constantine which determined the victory of the church the biological view of life is unknown to him he does not realize that morals and cooperation have been developed only to give a group coherence and strength against competing groups his theory of the spinning wheel indicates an oversimplification of this complex and interdependent economic world no nation can now remain medieval and be free having made this obeisance to reality we are free to accept and honor gandhi for his astonishing record of achievements first though leaping far ahead of the moral consciousness of mankind which is yet tribal and national he has helped the international organization of industries and states to prepare us for the larger morality in which the code of conduct between gentlemen will be because world order will necessitate it apply to the conduct of nations second he has given life and meaning to a christianity which had become among ourselves mere poetry and pretense he has lifted it up to a plane where the most unscrupulous statesmen must reckon with it 
as a great force. He has ennobled it beyond modern precedent by unconsciously attaching to its banner one-fifth of the human race. Third, he has for a generation kept a great revolutionary movement from all but sporadic violence. He has refused to unleash the mob. In this way, he has been a boon to all humanity, which is so sensitive now to disorder anywhere. He has approached one of the fundamental principles of statesmanship to persuade radicals that change must be gradual in order to be permanent and to persuade conservatives that change must be. Fourth, he has educated his people. He has aroused him as no man before in their history to the evils of untouchability, temple prostitution, child marriage, unmarriageable widows and the traffic in opium. Fifth, and despite his partial defense to that of caste system which perpetually divides and weakens India, he has, by the power of imagination and the word, given to India a psychological unity never possessed by it before, making all these races, languages and creeds feel and think alike as a prelude to united action. Sixth, he has given to his countrymen what they needed above everything else, pride. They are no longer hopeless or supine. They are prepared for danger and responsibility and therefore for freedom. If his way of thought seems alien to our skeptical and realistic West, let us remember that our way of thought would be maladapted and useless to the Hindus. The unifier of India could not be a politician, he had to be a saint. Because Gandhi thought with his heart, all India has followed him. 300 million people do him reverence and no man in the world wields so great a spiritual influence. It is as Tagore said of him. He stopped at the threshold of the huts of thousands of dispossessed, dressed like one of their own. He spoke to them in their own language. Here was living truth at last, and not only quotations from books. For this reason, the Mahatma, the name given to him by the people of India, is his real name. Who else has felt like him that all Indians are his own flesh and blood? When love came to the door of India, the door was opened wide. At Gandhi's call, India blossomed forth to new greatness, just as once before, in earlier times, when Buddha proclaimed the truth of fellow feeling and compassion among all living creatures. Perhaps Gandhi will fail, as saints are like to fail in this very Darwinian world. But how could we accept life if it did not, now and then, fling into the face of our successes some failures like this.